and we are back. A brand new episode of It's a Fair Question. And what better way to start than with Ricky Ross. Songwriter, producer, radio presenter and of course frontman of the legendary Deacon Blue. Ricky Ross is royalty in the Scottish music scene. So here we go, talking music, talking life, talking faith with Ricky Ross. Well, Ricky, thank you so much for joining me and agreeing to be on my little show, The Fair Question. I want to begin by saying this. I've been binging on your latest album. I have to say I'm really enjoying it. It's a beautiful album. Makes me think, though, it's been over 30 years since you recorded the first Deacon Blue album. I wonder, is it easier now or harder? And where do you seek your inspiration? Where are you finding new melodies and new hooks and new lyrical ideas? Uh, well, you always hope that you are. <laughs> uh, and then sometimes you find that you're not and you go, oh, wait a minute, have we done that before? I think that's one of the things that makes it... Uh, challenging as you get older is you 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 want to you you want to kind of it's an odd thing you want to sort of send out a signal saying this sounds like us so that people go right that's us I, I like them um and i will i will listen to that so that's some some subliminal message and if you don't sound enough like yourselves then of course people don't you know won't immediately like it but then there's also got to be the twist off. You've got to sound like yourself and it's sort of got to sound like it's moving on. So I think that's the, that's the thing. I mean, there's a famous story uh, of uh, an artist. Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was now, um, who was sued by his, his... Oh, it was Neil Young. Yeah, it was Neil Young who was sued by his record label for not sounding like Neil Young. <laughs> and he made these kind of really mad records for Geffen in the early 80s. So there's always that um, thing. And uh, with, with, this, with this record, it's not really a new record, to be honest. It's, it's an odd... It, this is a very odd... Uh, record because we wouldn't have made it ha had it not been for the times and it was really made in the in the in the lockdown it was songs some songs that we had around so they weren't even written at the same time but and some and and the bulk of the songs really were written for the last record city of love which was an odd again it was a strange phenomenon because i basically when i would handed that record in i i felt i'd i'd really worked harder on that record and written, you know, just gone right to the, the bones of the thing, you know, uh, almost as thoroughly as poured my soul into that record in, in a way that I hadn't, um, I, I didn't remember doing on any other record for a long time. But just just because we asked a lot of questions of ourselves and is this right, and threw things out and and got to a point of, of thinking, oh, this is really amazing. Uh, and then of course we put it out and, and the thing that the thing that you do as a as a songwriter and certainly as a musician, you know, as you're making a record, you all there's always a bit of your head that, and you say it within the band. You always, like, oh, it'd be great when we go out and play this live, of course. So none of these songs ended up getting played live. A couple of them got tried out in Australia, I think, when we were out there. Um, so with this new record, it's an odd one because it's not like a a, a body of work that you know you've been working towards. It's more. A, it was an attempt for us to really stay in touch with people uh, in the absence of, of, of going out and playing. Yeah. And obviously you're writing for yourself, for your own projects, but you're also writing for, for other artists and some pretty well-known folk within that list now. What kind of buzz do you get when you hear people, other people singing your songs? Well, for I, I did it for about 10 years, uh, from about... Uh, 2000 to about 2010, um, I'd sort of got lost, you know, in, in terms of, of, of Deacon Blue's career, certainly at that time. Um, and I signed a publishing deal at that time with Warner Chapel and did a lot of writing uh, for other people. And <laughs> the, first, the first thing you discover when you do that is you write, it's like a whole new world. 
And that new world involves, if you're an artist, you're way back down at, you know, if you're a writer, should I say, you're way back down at the bottom of the pile. So you're only, you're only a songwriter and you're in amongst all these other songwriters and they're all scrabbling around to try and get their songs cut. And it's actually, it's a funny thing, it's a, it's a buyer's market, you know, so it's really up to record labels, managers, artists to select songs. And I, I was kind of listening to someone, a, qu a quick thing from a podcast the other day about Sam Smith talking about writing 100 songs for a record. And that's, that's not unusual. So they'll go around writing with everyone, blah, blah, blah. Um, anyway, um, to answer your question properly, f yes, total buzz uh, from hearing a song. I always remember when I uh, wrote with J.B. Cullum and the first time I think I saw it performed or heard it was on <laughs> was on Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> and I was appalled because, <laughs> you know, I was watching my kids and, and all these dancers started going, well, get out of the way, just concentrate on the song. Uh, you know, I didn't, want, I didn't want anything to get in the way of the song. Um, but it's a real thrill, yeah, to, to get a song on someone else's record, hear it come through. But it's also a kind of, it's a strange old world. And I think I came to that world slightly too late and I, I, I'm in it as, because I'm a songwriter, but I'm not doing as much of it because I haven't as much time. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I reflect now, I'm quite happy about that because it's, it's, that world has changed so much in the last 10 years. So you used to get maybe one, two, three writers on a song. Three writers on a song in Nashville, for example, is quite common. There's all three writers. That number has gone up, not so much in America, but... But in pop writing, it's gone up from four writers to five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> so it begins to be like, what's the point? Because you think, would you ever write a song that would go out there, that would ask, you know, that would just, if you if you did something that was sort of kind of odd and weird and things, it would just get committed. You know, it's like writing a song by, well, you know what committees are like, Martin. <laughs> I live by committees, and even yeah. you're describing that, I'm thinking like song by committee. It, it sounded kind of like that, Ricky. Um, you've got your Radio Scotland programme, Another Country, and uh, and your love for that music and, and for Americana in general is, uh, is very obvious. But I'm interested what, what inspired you. What were you listening to when you were younger? If you don't know if you'll be able to see it in my bookshelves behind me. Oh, I've seen a Ramones book there. I've got the Ramones book there. I've got England's Dreaming, a kind of story of punk. Mm. I've got a history of the undertones. I've got Pete Townsend's autobiography. All the kind of stuff that had me going when I was young. But yeah. what was it that you heard? What songs did you hear when you were young that made you think, I can do that. I want to do that. Well, the thing that made me want to be a songwriter was the brackets on the Beatles records, you know, that was the, uh, the thing. Someone who lived just along the road from you, and not far from you, Michael Mara, uh, he said, uh, I don't want my name in lights, I want my name in brackets. Uh, and, you know, I, I related to that hugely. I just thought it was a, I kind of thought it was a sexy thing, you know, being a songwriter. And I always have a real strong memory of being in the car with my dad and my dad saying to me, uh, you know, Burt Bacharach, he's the man. He's the man that writes all these songs. And I just thought, for some reason, I just thought, that sounds like the thing to do. So I never grew up to be, in a, to be a singer, but the songwriting thing was the thing that really hooked me. So the fact that the Beatles wrote their own songs was really interesting for me. You know, you mentioned Pete Townsend there. I mean, he's another one. Gosh, I remember seeing The Who in 1975. Uh, and you're a Rangers fan, Martin, so maybe you didn't go to Parkhead to see The Who then, did you? I don't know, you're too young, are you? Just missed that one. But we went to see The Who in 1975, I think it was, 76 maybe, it might have been, 76. And, uh, uh, you know, Pete Townsend was an interesting character because, again, he's a writer. You know, he's like the, he's the writer in the band but not the singer in the band. Um, so all these characters were, were big I suppose Neil Young, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young as well. You know, the fact there's four songwriters, four artists. Uh, Neil Young, certainly. Uh, Springsteen, hugely, uh, in the 70s. Uh, Joni Mitchell. I, I love the sort of passage of, of, of uh, you know, just the, the changes that went on in Joni Mitchell. You know, the fact that she started off as this kind of folk singer and then went into this almost sort of jazz career. So all of that. And I think I was always drawn to American music. Uh, more maybe because it was just 
other, you know, maybe it's just because it, we didn't get, act, you know, we weren't there. So we had to use our imagination. And maybe just because I liked the sound of it, I just always thought that that had a had a kind of cachet about it. Um, so all of these Stones records I, I bought, you know, um, I, I loved a lot of the early punk stuff. I loved The Clash. Saw them in Dundee Caird Hall uh, in 1980, 79, 80. Uh, I loved all that stuff because, again, to me, it got back to the song, the three-minute song, the beauty of that, all that kind of stuff as well. Um, so I'm quite, probably quite eclectic. I mean, this morning, I, on a Wednesday morning, I often listen to Jamie Cullum's show from last night because he's on air at the same time as I am. And uh, I love his jazz show on radio too. So, you know, I, I kind of go all... Do you do, you do that? Do you, do you, are you quite eclectic? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I, I'm having to be to kind of even attempt to keep up with my kids. <laughs> They're all kind of... <laughs> early 20s now and uh, listening to completely different stuff but I'm trying to listen I'm trying not to be yeah. like my dad uh, you know who would say uh, what, a, what, what a racket what a racket what a racket yeah yeah, I know they used to come in the room, didn't they? On the top of the pot. What's that? What's that? No, you know, and and, and you you felt vaguely ashamed. It's, 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 all, it's, all, we're caught, it's like being caught in something, smoking at the back or something. Well, it was a wee bit like that. I actually remember uh, a boy, a boy at my secondary school came to my door with a a copy of Sex Pistols' first album, mm. and he had it under his jacket, and it was like he was looking around <laughs> to see, and he sold it to me for two pounds, and. I sneaked it into my bedroom and hid it under my bed for fear of being caught with it. And uh, and it seemed subversive to be listening to that music in those days, but it completely grabbed me, I have to say. And you know what? It's a great sounding record. Uh, it really is. Um, I uh, I interviewed Glenn Matlock one, at one point. And, and so I, I kind of went back. I was I was depping for someone else's show on Radio Scotland. And uh, I, interviewed, I read his book, actually, and he was doing a thing about his book. And he's so proud of making these records, you know, because they, they were so, it was him, he was, he was the guy, he was the guy who was putting all of it together. And they were a good band, you know, they sounded great. Still do, still do. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, Ricky, if you, if you Google anything like Scotland's best ever songs or Scotland's favourite anthems, you cannot find a list that doesn't include dignity somewhere on that list, either at the top or very near the top. And, I guess for many people, uh, that will be your song. Mm. Um, tell me a bit about it. How did it come into being? Uh, you know, what was it that triggered the ideas behind that song? And, and how do you think about it now? Because I guess you can't play a show, uh, well, when you're allowed to. I guess you can't play a show without including it. Would there be a riot you know, in the front <laughs> rows? I think it would be unfair to play a show without it, certainly. That, that, I'll come to that, but... First of all, first things first, I'll tell you um, a more recent thing about it, which is it was recently voted Scotland's favourite song on a, a, a radio station thing. And at the end, uh, after it had come out in the papers, a, a good, a really good friend of mine is called Father Joe Bolan, uh, who is he's a retired priest now, lives in, he lives in Largs now. And <laughs> Joe's got a great sense of humour. Uh, and he sort of said to me, I saw that, you know, Dignity being voted number number one song. He says, is that including Burns? <laughs> I said, no. I said, no, it's not including, it's not including Harry Lauder either, to be honest, you know, but I said, but good point, you know, exactly. Um, so what happened was, I was trying to write songs about, I was trying to write songs that mattered, you know what I mean? I was trying to write something that, that said, um, this is who I am, and this is the world I see, or that kind of thing. You know, you try to write songs that kind of make. And I'd left the band that I was in <laughs> to do that because I, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of felt, you know, unhappy where I was. And then I realised, but I wasn't writing any of them. I wasn't, I wasn't saying anything. And, and the one, when I tried to do it, it just came out as a bit clumsy. And um, if I could remember exactly where Dignity came from. I can remember writing it. I remember the moment that I wrote the lyric down. Um, but the, what I can't remember is, you know, the whole chain of events. But I, I was aware at the time, I was living in Pollock Shields in Glasgow. Um, and I was aware, this is 1985, and there was high unemployment. And there was a whole discussion about, you know, wouldn't it be great if everyone could get a job? Uh, and I remember thinking, yeah, that'd be great. But 
there'd be a whole lot of people who would be doing jobs that no one else wanted to do. So it was really about that whole idea of the dignity of labour and all the rest of it and, and how, you know, well, that, that's great, that's great. But people are, and of course now we still have that discussion because we, we have the discussion that the whole lot of the jobs that people don't want to do, they get farmed out, if you pardon the pun, to, to people from, say, Eastern Europe or, or further afield. So that was the, the discussion. And of course, unemployment was in the air, but it wasn't really about unemployment. It was about that thing of, of just keeping your head down and keeping doing the thing that you're doing that you don't really love doing. I was teaching at the time. I loved doing it. I enjoyed it. But I was... I was a colleague of many people who just didn't want to be there. You know, you get you'd get people on a Monday morning filling in their pool's coupon and saying, "Oh, yeah, I'm, if I could get out of here." And I was on summer holidays, and I was in Crete, and I remember reading an article in the, I think it was a Sounds magazine about Morrissey, and it was it was headline thoughts, home thoughts from abroad. You know, the Robert Browning poem. poem. And I thought that's a great idea. You know, just maybe you reflect more about the place that you come from when you're away. So hence the references to Raki and all that kind of stuff. So as a guy thinking about home, being away from home and thinking about a dream that he has. And it, the boat thing is another here and there. It's about just having a dream. And that's why I think people relate to it. I, I, the, 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 guy, the, the guy that walks along the street, I think came from Pollock Shields. I used to look out my window and I used to see these guys with these massive brushes uh, walking up the street. Where are these guys coming from? And I think there was a cleansing depot at the bottom of Kenmuir Street where I lived. And it made sense that they would be walking up the street. And I think I probably went, well, yeah, well, you know, what's, what's that? You know? So I think all these things came together. I wrote a lyric down and I, I did it an unusual way. I, I very rarely do that. It's very, I, I never do it now. Wrote, or I, if I do it now, it doesn't work. Um, and I wrote this lyric down, took it with me home. And when I got home, I put some music to it. And we didn't start doing it. Doogie and I had formed that band that, that summer. And I think it was, it wasn't really till the following early, early part of the next year that we started putting it in the show. And then when we did and we got it right, it started to connect with people. Yeah, yeah. You know, my favorite part is the kind of uh, end section, um, thinking about home, mm. thinking about faith, thinking about work. Let me ask you, why those three things? Well, there was a book at the time um, called Earthly Powers by Anthony Burgess that had come out, which I really loved. Um, I still love. And every time he came across the word home, it sort of, it just, it, his world spun round. You know, it, it was, it was a, it was, it was, a, it was one of these words. He, you know, where was it? What, what was it? How do I get back there? Um, and it was this, you know. Just a, a very heavily loaded phrase for him in the book, of the character in the book, should I say? Um, and I, I think about, I think the other words that were like that for me were well, home. Home was one, and faith was another. Trying to make sense of that, um, and work was this ambiguous thing because it was this thing that that, that you know kept you all going, but you resented it, and lots of people resented it. Um, and faith has just been a big part of my world, you know. It's just it, it, so I suppose that <laughs> I suppose that's a bit in the song where it leaps from a song, a story being sung by a character to 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 to, to my input. And I think I think probably Martin, you've you've got to well, you'll know this as well. I think that you, when you connect with people when you're doing a sermon, when you you look in and you see the, the glazed faces, and then suddenly you think, oh, they're, they're with me now. Um, I think it's because you put yourself into that story sometimes, isn't it? I'm sure it must happen to you. So maybe it's me putting myself into that story. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever I've ever attempted anything that's not autobiographical in some sense. Uh, you know, I think it comes out of you the more, um, mm. more than maybe people connect to that. And you know, the the middle of those words you you just touched on there, uh, faith, Ricky. I, I mean, you were raised within a a, a faith tradition. I. Uh, so happens I was speaking on Monday to uh, a gentleman who led the, uh, the youth group at church that you were part of. And, ah, who was that? Uh, Chick Reed. Oh, Chick. Well, I could t I could talk for an hour on Chick. Yeah. Well, yeah. he talked he talked about you for an hour and uh, tell me a story about a camp you were on once and you yeah. were stuck up a tree with a, a herd of cows at the bottom and. <laughs> 
But he was he was talking then about your creativity and some of the stuff that went on and uh, and the kind of charisma you had and of course he spoke very fondly and, and uh, so so that was your teen years, Ricky and, and here you are now mm. and and to what extent has faith been a sort of journey part of your life and 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 where are you now with all of that stuff faith, faith and spirituality? Well, you know it's a really interesting thing. I I grew up so Chick was a. A brilliant guy. He was our youth fellowship leader, you know, and, and we all loved him and still do, actually. And it's funny because he's, he's got the one phone number that I still remember, and I, I could tell you it now, but because uh, I used to be on the phone to him. And, we, we, you know, he's one of these guys that, you know, he'd get you working on his garden or any anything for you. I remember bashing my mum's car. Uh, I was early driving and, and I, I dented my mum's wing and I went straight on the chicks. He's a mechanic, you know. What did I do about this? You know, he bashed it out, you know, it was, it was fantastic. Um, he, uh, th that experience that I had growing up, my, my parents were in the, the Brethren. It was quite a liberal Brethren. The Brethren gets a, you know, it's got a, quite a big sort of story recently about Jim McLean being brought up in, and the, there's a great piece by uh, uh, Graham Spears recently about Willie, Willie McLean and the choice between, uh, he, he made a choice between, the, 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 someone said to him, either you're going to be in the meeting or you're in the Brethren or your or you're football, what's it going to be? Is it God or football? And he said, oh, well, there's no choice, it's got to be football. And I'm, I said to Lorraine, my wife, I said, see, that's the whole thing. It's the difference between religion and faith. That's not, that wasn't a choice between God and football. That was a choice between a system, some man-made, if you'll pardon this phrase, god-awful system, um, and and football. The choice between God and football, if he, if he didn't count it God, he, he wouldn't have it problem you know god loves football <laughs> because god loves people being happy so that sort of liberal illiberal uh brother tradition it wasn't that but it was strict you know we didn't do things on a sunday but it gave me something it gave me a belief in uh in in jesus in the person of jesus you know and i think that's the I think that's all you can hope for. You know, there's a great story about Karl Barth. You'll know the great story of, which I, I cling on to after the First World War when everything, and you think, boy, what we're going through now, it's nothing compared to some of the suffering and horrible things that happened in the First World War. And we was asked what his faith meant, and he started singing, Jesus loves me. That's all he knew. This I know. Yeah, well, that's, that's some... <laughs> That's, that's enough to be getting on with. <laughs> and I think that's what's carried me through. So my faith journey has been has gone from a Protestant tradition to a Catholic tradition. But I don't, you know, uh, no one has the no one has a hold on on that stuff. You know, we're all just passing through. Um, and and I, I feel grateful for all the people that I've encountered all the way through who've, and I feel very grateful to people from other faiths. So one of the things I, I did for about 10 years was doing the BBC Radio Scotland Sunday morning program where I met amazing people from Jewish tradition, Muslim tradition, Buddhist tradition, who, who I, I think, you know, we learn from. So um, I think you hold dearly your own faith. I, I certainly do. It's, it's very, it's been very important to me in the last year. I think it's, it, it's the only thing I, I, I kind of go there first before I go to the news, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, but it's it's been an interesting journey, which is I've ended up in 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 the in the Catholic tradition, which is which suits me more. But but I I don't feel that's uh, you know to 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 put anyone else anyone else's position down or to to comment on anyone else's position. You know, one of the one of the great things uh, in my year serving as moderator has been the work that we've done uh, across the denominations. Uh, you know, within the Christian faith and the the friendships that we've built up as we've shared with one another. You know how we've how we've gone about um, keeping the life of the church going in the face mm. of the pandemic, and so and so to have us all together uh, on that forum of Christian leaders has been fantastic. And you absolutely uh, are. Are made clear that anything that may be different about us is completely submersed by that which we have in common, mm. and uh, you know we're working at that. So yeah, it's so interesting hearing about your progression through that, and uh, it's the authenticity of it that that counts absolutely, Ricky. And uh, 
you know, God or football. Um, yeah, it's sad, it's sad to hear that. You know, as if there was a compartmentalization going on here that, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll do God now and then. Um, one of the other things that I'm heavily involved in is, uh, you know, debate between faith and, and science. And so often popular culture presents that as a choice. You know, it's one or the other. <laughs> or I, I believe in science as if that meant I couldn't also believe in God. Yeah. Yeah, I love, you know, when it, when it comes to some of these things and mystical things bumping into that, two things that I cling on to a lot is I love the character in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe of the old professor who sits and and the and the kids come to him with these kind of crazy, crazy stories and and they think, well, he must be quite logical, so he'll just, he'll poo-poo all this stuff about, you know, wardrobes and witches and and, and, and he kind of looks on. Oh, what do they teach them at these schools? You know, do you, do you not think? Do you know, do you, do you not think there's, there's another otherness? You know, it's it's brilliant the way he just kind of goes. No, of course, you know, that's that's, you know, that's this mystical element that that is part of life. Another great quote I, I keep coming back to is one of your, uh, well, what would have been one of your colleagues? Well, if you'd if you'd been in another generation, George McLeod, who who when he when people talk about strange things happening and. And he says, and if you think that's a coincidence, I hope you have a very dull life. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you know, this business of the otherness, Ricky, that I, I, I really like the, the Glasgow band Admiral Fallow. And, mm. uh, you know, they have this song, Isn't This World Enough? Yeah, it's great. And that's a great song. But it, it seems to be saying, you know, well, why would you want anything else? Why would you want to be looking more and beyond? There's plenty right here. Mm. And I, I kind of get that. I don't want to live with my feet anywhere else than on the ground. Mm. And yet, I think I'm still open to the other. And as you say, take that out. And do we consign ourselves to very dull lives? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, um, I think there has to be a hope and a mystery of, a, of, of something. You know, this is a year when people, most people, I would think, have gone through the experience of loss. I mean, it's now... You know, when you when you look at the numbers in the in the pandemic, a lot of people have lost people. Okay, there are older people who might have had other illnesses and so on. But nevertheless, I think probably certainly I know in our family, and it's happened even overnight, just in the last last night, they lost someone there. Um, it's 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 something that you you go through, and so you have to ask yourself the question. Well, you know, and I think it comes out. It's more poignant and more you know, opposite, I think, when you consider young lives who are lost. And, you, you know, uh, there was a big thing about the Manchester Bomb Inquiry and stories of these kids. And you think, you know, how do you make sense of something like that? I, I don't know how you do it, but I don't know how you do that without a sense of there being, of there being another, of, the, of, the, of this world being just part of the story. I think that I think that that that, that seems to me to be an important thing. I don't, I don't love the idea that we're all it's all just so we can be judged and and, and you know there's some sort of god as as judge and we're all going to be sifted and all that kind of thing. And that, that's not the point of it. The point of it is surely that 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 we just don't know everything. And and and, and but also the the beauty of our relationships with our parents and grandparents, brothers and sisters, whoever it is we've lost, you can't imagine that that's just gone forever. I, 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 I certainly cling on to that quite strongly. I hope so too. So Ricky, just to maybe bring things towards a conclusion, you mentioned hope. I wonder if you're more hopeful now or less so than, let's say, those 30 plus years ago when the first Deacon Blue album came out. As you look at Scotland and the world, where's your hope coming from? Well, I think you know one one thing that's that I think is true, whether people like this or not, is that the world is probably becoming a better place to live in. Um, now, you know, people go, oh, wait, wait a minute, hold on, <laughs> you know, um, but it's true. You know, people are living longer. Uh, uh, things are um, health is is getting better. Um, um, disease is being worked on quite radically in places like sub-Saharan Africa where I've gone and visited and so on. Um, farming technologies are, are changing things. So there's that side of things which is 
progression. Um, and then there's the other side, of which we all know, continuing war, continuing domination of, you know, we, we, the, the stories in China at the moment, the, the, the stories of, of um, uh, you know, continuing stories of oppression of, of minorities and so on, that never seem to go away. Yes, these stories are there. So I think you've got to kind of balance these things out. Um, I tend to, <laughs> I tend to fall on the optimistic side uh, about a lot of these things, in terms of in terms of hope, because I see, even in the times that we're in, incredible effort, the human effort, just to to, to get that vaccine made. I mean, I, I just I just think it's incredible stuff, and human beings' ability to 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 conjure up scientifically you know wonderful things to counter wh where we're going and and to to imagine that we can actually overcome these odds that, that never fails to amaze me i mean it's just incredible so i think that gives me on balance hope but i think you've got to you know be realistic about about things and there's still there's always going to be things you know <laughs> you and I know that verse well, the poor you will always have with you. But what does that mean? Does, does that mean that you get lazy about things? Of course it doesn't. It means that that's going to be the thing that you have to look out for. You have to, you have to be constantly trying to, to make the world a better place. I think that's what Jesus means in that verse. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and it's not an excuse. It's not a, oh well, that's the way it is. Just yeah, you know, status quo, leave it be. So um, not at all. It's what gets me up in the morning, to be honest. That there mm. are those challenges uh, in the world that we face. We we partner together in addressing them, and we do so with hope. I think to strip out hope and uh, and we give up. Uh, you know, I think I, I think for me certainly, Ricky. I want to uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you'll have plenty to do, promoting work and so on at the moment, as well as everything else. So I'm really grateful you took some time out to chat and for this episode of It's a Fair Question. And uh, can I just finish by wishing you well, career-wise, and, uh, and with all of life. And uh, it's been great to chat. Thanks very much. You too, Martin. It's, it's lovely to speak to you. And uh, I wish you well the rest of your moratorial year. And... Uh... And then presumably back to the parish work. Are you going to go back to just... just your... Yeah, that's a normal pattern. And uh, I look forward to that. I've been serving nationally and I'll serve locally again and it'll, it'll all be the same. So I look forward to that. Yeah, great. Lovely to speak to you. Thank you. Bye for now.